2.25 p.m. Stockholm time, or I should say probably Uppsala time, because that is where Uppsala, uh, the great Uppsala event, Upstart happens. And uh, of course, you know that because you're here. And um, with me tonight, uh, I have Lauri Reuter, my dear friend from Finland, who is still hangover from Slush, I suppose. Uh, that happened the other few days. And uh, he's... <clears throat> He's decided, bravely enough, to join me here in Santa's Grotto in Stockholm uh, with me, Joe and Jorgensen, to discuss, <coughs> sorry, ho, 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 the secret of funded food tech companies. I would assume that that also means the secret of how to fund your food tech, food tech companies in the future. Um, and Well, in all essence, it boils down to what are the investors looking for and... Uh, since Lowry is a wonderful investor, I should call him Dr. Lowry, by the way, because he's a proper scientist turned VC, so he knows what he's talking about. And uh, with Nordic Food Tech uh, VC, uh, it's, <coughs> sorry, Nordic Food Tech Ventures, it's called. Um, he's one of the few pan-Nordic food tech investors that we have. Lowry, who are you? <laughs> that's a, that's a, Tricky question to start with. Uh, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, like I said, I'm a, I'm a researcher turned investor. I uh, used to work in biotech research still a few years ago. And after that, I did a little stint in um, figuring out in how to move great technologies and science-based ideas from academics into the real world, so to say. In, in form of startup sales, working at BTT here in Finland, trying to figure out the innovation pathways. And after that moved sort of down or up in the pipeline, I don't know which way it is, but forward in the pipeline and uh, stepped in the shoes of an investor. So uh, now pulling innovation out of research instead of pushing it out of research. This is, um, this is yeah. Sorry, yeah, Larry, go ahead. I'll, I'll just grab my phone here because it's only me and Laura today. And, and some of you might might wonder what happened to this guy, Eric Burenius from Trellis Road, who was supposed to be here as well. Well, he's come down with what with some with what some people think is coming out of a science lab in China. Uh, I suppose it is. And he's home now curating himself. And we, we, we said that, no, you don't have to be here, even though we cannot get COVID from you because you're we are online. But he said, sent his 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 regards to us, and uh, I have a couple of messages from him that we'll dive into later on today. Uh, and um, but this is interesting, Larry coming from the science side, and you might wonder who is this bearded guy um, sitting in in this in his uh, chair and, and trying to host this discussion. So my name is Joanne Jorgensen, and I run something called Sweden Food Tech, where we help entrepreneurs and big corps understand. What is the future of food? And then to position themselves into that future. And actually, Lowry, I've known Lowry for many, many years. And uh, he's one of the few guys that have been around from the beginning of this. So he's seen a lot. And science, actually, is, is super important. Because I, I will, you know, give you a few inputs from Eric here that we perhaps can kickstart the discussion with and talk around. Because I think he fairly summarizes the whole thing uh, he says there is such a huge amount of money these days so it's the founders market loads of billions slushing around uh, without a home there are way too many companies in plant-based meat substitutes without defensibility so another recipe how many of those do you see every day well i guess i see a new company popping up every day with a plant-based meat substitute that that's going to ride an amazing hockey stick at least according to their decks um and then back to the notion of why why laura is so important here we're looking for more teams that have a combination of scientific expertise and the experience of building startups um and scientists who want to get in VC money to their companies need to be prepared to give away large amounts uh, of their ownership 
to the entrepreneurs building the company. So that that was the the notion from Eric Berenius, who is is heading up this investment company called Trellis Road, who started Pizza.com, uh, whatever it was called, or Pizza Online, I think perhaps was called in Sweden, and then sold that for a shitload of money to an international uh, giant in the, in the delivery space. So Eric knows what he's talking about. But let's talk a bit a bit, bit about successful fundings, Lowry. What would you say? looking at the stuff that you see around you what has been uh, successful you know components or or the components of successful companies that have been funded so i think we can sort of start from kind of agreeing that there's a huge need to fix things in the food system we all know that and we can also agree that there is a lot of capital available for food tech especially in the past couple of years um so it's one could say that it's relatively easy to get in touch with investors who want to fund food. Um, but that doesn't mean that every idea is a good idea, obviously. And I think there's, there's two very obvious key components. Uh, one is that you need to be doing a right thing, the right thing. Um, and the second is that you need to have the, well, the capabilities and the tools to actually make it happen. So, mm -hmm. Let's let's start from the first one. Um, food, especially, is a field where it seems everybody has an opinion, everybody has an idea, that everybody thinks they are right. And if you go online and start googling diets, you can get you can get lost, and you will get lost. Um, so that is sort of blurring the picture a bit. Uh, and I, I'm I'm being blunt here. There's a lot of nonsense out there, um, sort of covered in the wrappings of, of food tech and saving the world. Um, so I think that's somewhere where investors need to be sharp and know what they're doing to invest right things that actually move the food system into right direction. Um, there are also a lot of ideas that might make a lot of money related to food that are actually pushing the situation to even worse direction. And I'm, I'm talking about, you know, funding a new Red Bull, you know, might be very good business, but it's not going to improve uh, the, the situation on the planet for the planet or for the people. So it's, it's very important to be very sort of sober with your thinking and really ask the questions. Why are we doing this? Does this actually make things better for the world? And is this actually a more sustainable idea and business? Uh, both the, uh, the entrepreneurs need to be very sober about that and the investors. And then the second thing is, is something that you kind of touched already. Um, you need capabilities and competence. Um, you need defendable technology in order to build a very successful startup company. And now you should kind of separate very interesting and great food companies, meaning you have a recipe, you have a new kind of a muffin that you want to sell, you know, it might be a great idea, go ahead and do it. But it might not be a venture capital investable idea. If you want to make something where you attract venture capital, heavy investments, you need technology that can be defended. You need some process that you can hold as a secret and only you can do or some technology that you can patent. Um, without those, uh, you, you cannot, I mean, it's not attractive for an investor to, to get on board and put a lot of risk money into it. And that is sometimes a bit blurry when it comes to food. Uh, is... Recipes are very hard to protect. Yeah. No, I think it's super blurry. I think this is interesting because once upon a time when I decided to go from the traditional tech sector into food tech, which is a little more than a decade ago, I did that because I was bombarded by really shitty business plans from left and right, insignificant ideas. And actually now I see this happening all over again because I thought that I had found my home in food and where everything is to a certain degree significant or at least tasty and hopefully would save the world and the health of people on it. But hey, and then you wake up and you, you've, your inbox is bombarded by shitty business plans. I have a, yet another bar made made from not with sugar, but with sugar from dates. 
yeah, and that's super healthy. And now I'm going to have a trillion dollars of you because this will sell like, I don't know what, but it won't, right? And a lot of this technology is low grade and we need to have more high grade technology. That's for sure. Um, but Lowry, when you take a look at, could you give me some examples of companies that you think are super cool for venture funding? Now, I must say, I don't always support venture funding as a as a method for food companies or food tech companies. It's just for a tiny fraction of them that are investable. But let's focus on those that that can, you know, where we can find the right combination between VC investors and and food tech here. Um, now I'm, I'm thinking, you know, obviously I'm an investor. Uh, yes. We have invested in food companies, and obviously it's very it would be very attractive to use one of those as an example. Well, you, um, may, you may, I'm glad there are no. I will. So, so um, one of the companies that we have invested um, recently is called Enifer Bio. Um, and essentially what they do is they take side streams, so waste from the bioethanol industry, feed that to a fungus, a microbe growing in a steel tank. They harvest the microbe and make fish feed out of that. I just had in slush some meatballs made out of their stuff and it tastes actually pretty good. So. Uh, there's a good indication they might be entering human food at some point as well. So what makes this sort of very investable and attractive for an investor is that there is uh, the whole thing is a spin out from research. So the technology is actually very well established. We know that it works. We know that it can scale and there is sufficient research around it so that we know that we can reach certain price points with it. So it's not it's not a crazy idea that somebody came up with and you know made a PowerPoint slide, but it's it's technology that has been worked on for actually decades already in academic context uh, and in industry. And now it's a bunch of scientists who took it out and decided that we are going to bring this in use and build a company around it. So there is defendable IP. Uh, there is strong technology that this company owns. And there's a strong team that knows very well what they're doing. So that makes it a very sort of fundable um, company. Also, the value proposition is massive. I mean, we are eating crazy amounts of fish and more than half of the fish we eat globally comes from aquaculture. So it's not from, you know, fishing, but it's actually farmed fish and farmed fish need to eat something. and they eat half other fish and half soy and you know both are not very sustainable uh, sources of feed so this this enifer bio is is solving a real problem and actually a massive problem in a scalable way so the purpose is there the technology is there the team is there um all it needs is is venture capital to to scale it fast so that that is a good example of something that is investable and if i may give you an example of something that is not investable. And I, I think I <laughs> I can do it without putting anyone else in a bad spot because it, it was my own idea. I think some years back when I was a young scientist, um, we came up in, you know, in, in the lab with an idea that I, I was growing plant cell cultures in the lab for my for my PhD research. And there was, you know, strawberry cells and lingonberry cells and, and all that growing in the lab. And I came up with a crazy idea that maybe I just take some of those cells in the lab and grow them at home in my kitchen and then, you know, see how they taste like and whether I could, you know, do something funky with it. And then it went a bit too far and we, we started preparing, you know, launch of a company that would sell these home bioreactors that you could have in your kitchen and grow your own lingonberry jam there. And it went so far that we had a we had a discussion around the table with my colleagues you know should we start a company should we should we you know offer this to an investor and we were already in talks with investors and we decided not to do it because yes it would be a fun idea yes we would have protectable ip yes we would have a competent team 
but there was just absolutely no need for that. I mean, there is no problem in the world that that solution would have fixed. I mean, there is no lack of lingonberries. And it's not a more sustainable way of producing food. It might be actually less sustainable way to produce food, although it's fun. Um, and that is, you know, not quite enough uh, to justify investments. So we did actually, not do it. And it was good that we did not do it. Come on, come on. I mean, like, you know, you know as well as I do that that company would fly through the investors the, these days. You would get as much money as you could dream of. Uh, you know, if it's if it's valid or not, that's another question. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, but this... unfortunately, I think you're right. Yeah. One could raise, you know, 10 million or 20 yep. with that idea. And I still, you know, I'm I'm yes, I should be opportunistic as as a you know investor, but there's still enough scientists in me to say that, you know, I'm not doing that because it's not <laughs> it's it doesn't make it doesn't have any impact. It's not worth doing. And luckily, more and more investors are very impact focused now. And it's getting harder and harder to get funding if you cannot justify true positive impact with what you're doing. No, I totally agree with you. And I think that's a very good development on the investor front because investors are getting smarter and smarter. And uh, not just the VCs, but also the big money and, and uh, the corporate VCs as well. Because what you've been touching with Enifer uh, as well on a, on a big issue here, whereas everyone thinks that food today needs to be something that you plug into the current food chain. And, you know, I, I usually use two terms, reformulate and restructure. And, and a, new, a new, you know, veggie beef patty, that's a reformulation. You try to take meat out of the equation. But you, do, but you still need to plug it into the S group or the K group if you're in Finland or the ICAs and Coops if you're in Sweden or the Tesco's and Walmarts of the world. It's, you're still stuck in a system and that system essentially pushes people to the limits both in terms of health and planetary health. Uh, whereas restructuring, that's where the game really changes. You know, the type of game that is before the internet and after the internet type of thing and when you talk about using side streams uh from uh, you know various types of industries in order to grow fish feed hey suddenly you've changed the game and you can start using other uh, partners than, than than you did before and to me this is also one of the most interesting parts of of the funding race here it's not just about you as an entrepreneur and pouring in investor money into that idea it's also finding the other partners that can help you make this go big and i that's also something i see investors are you know increasingly interested in hearing about industrial partnerships fueled by money fueled by invest uh, entrepreneurial skills that that is actually very good that you brought that up um so you need to have the partners and you need to have a product that is sort of fits easily to the existing system while making an improvement. So mm. you, you need to make something new, but it cannot be so new that there wouldn't be anyone buying it. Uh, you know, in case of any for bio, they have a completely new kind of protein source, but it will fit in to the current system like that. So, the one who will purchase and you know buy their their stuff their product does not need to reconfigure their system it's a drop in product although made in a completely new way oh. um another another um good example is is actually a swedish company that we invested in called melt and marble they are making fundamentally they're making beef fat so that juicy and you know soft and melting fat that makes food so great they're making that using microbes, so without the animal. And again, it's a drop in product. The product is exactly the same as beef fat would be. It would be used exactly in the same way as coconut fat is now used in plant-based foods. It just makes you know the end product, the quality of the end product much better. So it's very high technology, completely new kind of production system. But the product is, we can put the product in use right now. Whereas in contrast, 
there, there are some companies out there who are developing, for example, um, say a, uh, a, an ingredient for cultivated meat. So these meat made from animal cells. And their market is not there yet. I mean, we don't know when and if there will ever be affordable and upscaled cultivated meat production. Uh, so that's a big question mark. It's a big risk. We don't know if there ever will be anybody buying their product. So it's a really hard decision for an investor to invest in such thing because there's risk of this company. But there's also massive risk of whether they will ever have customers. So it needs to be new. Yes, but preferably it would still fit into the current system. And that's that's a consideration, obviously, that investors are taking it to you know that i think it's interesting it's also uh, about the time frame here is are, are you working with a the current time frame of a fund which usually is maturing at what is it eight to ten years something like that yeah. so you invest for three or four years and then you do follow-ons for another few years and then the fund closes and then you better be ready to be sold as a company to somebody else otherwise you might just be dumped onto another fund yeah. somewhere uh, and sometimes food takes longer because it's it's slightly slower chunkier etc uh are vcs really good for 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 the entrepreneurs or do we need to start looking as as entrepreneurs or founders uh for other sources of capital so if you if you're working on something that you can sell probably in you know 10 years or 20 years then there is very rare vcs that would jump on it um so the promise you need to have is that i mean we can tolerate some some delay. I mean, we can tolerate that you're working on technology that is not there yet, but we probably want to see you being able to sell something in like latest at five in five years. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, I mean, the food system requires that we need to fix our food system within the coming decade, not in 20 years. So we yeah. need fast solutions and the investors also need relatively fast cases. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be working on solutions for 2050s, but then it might be that it's more relevant to continue developing those in academic context or get the funding from uh, someone else than VCs with, you know, eight year uh, lifespan. Yeah, no, we had actually a question here uh, from Martin on aspect is that guys impact. Is that all about saving the planet or about having fun? Well, Martin, <laughs> I can assure you one thing it is. It's not fun to see the planet you know, go down in flames as it is right now. Um, but that said, you're you're also onto something because there are a lot of people out there wanting to fund, you know, as I say, fun or funky companies, and and we've always seen that. Uh, it might be interesting to to be seen with a new Gucci handbag as opposed to something made, you know, made out of leather as opposed to something made out of mycelium or so uh, but i for sure know what will save the planet and i think it's important also here in this this sense to realize that what we're cooking up in our relatively decent food systems in the nordics and our clean environments um, uh, we need to make sure that we we fix the food systems in china and india because otherwise we'll just import the negative aspects of it to our communities as well through air. Yeah, uh, I, I do agree. I mean, uh, I, I think many fun innovation might be very good uh, investments as well. Um, and there are, you know, different kind of investors as well. For some, the impact is very important mm -hmm. and they won't take any, you know, greenwashing or nonsense, empty claims on, on impact. And then there are investors who, for who it's not that important. I mean, they won't hear any nonsense either, but for them, you don't even necessarily need to claim that there is impact here. You say that, you know, here's, here's something that is extremely delicious. Uh, people want this. It's good business. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, and it's legal, you know, uh, <laughs> to do. Uh, and for some investors, that's completely fine. So what I'm saying that if, is that um, maybe food, especially, you need to find the right investor for your company to yep. be investable.
and investors might be very different. Yeah, but but all, let's also make sure that, that it's not just about the food objects themselves. It's a lot about the data surrounding the food objects and how you help with tech to organize these food objects. Personally, I, I'm really uh, keen on seeing more companies out there coming with solutions for me as an individual, for my individual eating habits, both helping me analyze myself and my needs, but also then giving me the food that I that I need, preferably as a service. And I think a lot of people in the food world are stuck in the notion that we need to produce food and the and, and cook and eat food in the way we've always done. Uh, Seventy percent of Swedes don't like to cook, and to be honest, they shouldn't be. We should take the keys to the kitchen from them because what happens when they go into the kitchen? They immediately screw up and and uh, you know kill all the good ingredients that they might have. Most certainly, most of the time, they don't have good ingredients that are unhealthy bad for the planet and then they wasted most of it because they throw it away because it tastes like shit and so so i i'd like to to see a more professional attitude towards food it's time for to throw out the amateurs of the food yeah. equation and you know i don't i don't want to see any more companies promising a bit faster delivery of grocery a bit wider range of of you know meals you could order in that's there. I mean, that's not. It's not important to improve the speed a bit. What is important um, is to figure out a business model, how a company can grow and make money out of making you make better decisions. That exactly. would be interesting. That would be impactful. But a faster delivery. I mean, what's the now, point? I mean, if if you look look at these uh, delivery services right now, you can see at least in Sweden, you can see the text. You know our rankings might be impacted by our business model. So, um, so in short, they're saying, yeah, we'll we'll sell you the stuff, we'll nudge you to buy the stuff that we make the most money out of. And this this is back to the algorithms. What do the algorithms yeah. uh, want us to do? And we need for sure to have good algorithms out there, uh, transparent, uh, vetted algorithms that help help us with this. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. Uh, so, so um, you didn't mention solar foods, Lowry, uh, as a good example. Oh, they are. They are a fantastic example. I feel that we're just talking so much about solar foods here oh. in Finland and in Nordics. <laughs> Sometimes good you have other examples. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so if some of you don't know, solar food is a company uh, making fundamentally food out of thin air, um, feeding feeding a microbe with uh, carbon dioxide and nitrogen from the air and electricity. Um, and they're starting, actually they're now, right now, starting to build a factory here in Finland, the first commercial scale factory and uh, putting their product on the market in, I think, 2023. So uh, really looking forward to it. I mean, it's, it's a complete, it's not just one new company doing something funky. It's a completely new industry producing food in a completely different way. And it's uh, super exciting. Yeah, moving it forward, moving it into the city environment, because we have to realize that about 80% of all the food that is produced, it happens in the cities, in urban areas. That's where it's cooked and consumed and wasted. So probably, you know, producing or growing things far, far, far away in the countryside, transporting it on diesel trucks into city centers, bad idea. We need to find other you know, other methods that, that weaves itself into the fabric of life. This is actually an interesting um, sort of thinking around food. I think, I actually don't think we need to take food production into the cities because there is sort of two curves that meet in the middle. Um, the the uh, space is extremely expensive in cities and food production always takes a lot of space, no matter how you do it, even if it's vertical farming or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, Transportation is part of the expenses and, and the impact of food, but not, not a massive part. So I think where, where the sweet spot is, is that we bring food production relatively close to the cities and close to these sort of logistic hubs where it's easy to transport it to where people use it. But it doesn't always make sense to bring it right into the city. Not in the it doesn't, there is not that much added benefit from the logistics perspective. No, but I think this if, you, is... if you think of places like, um, like you know, Egypt, <laughs> or 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 places where food production will become harder and harder when climate is changing, so bringing some food production 
in the country is already much better than transporting food from other side of the world, especially because we have now realized that the logistic systems are quite fragile. Yeah, no, ab absolutely and totally agree with that. So I think time is actually unfortunately up. It flies when you're having fun, as I always have with Lowry. And I hope you enjoyed some of the conversations as well. I think it's important to summarize here that, yeah, what makes your company fundable uh, if you want to have the big monies, uh, show us the big problems and solve them. Yeah. And solve them with science and seriously. And don't give us any more bars or uh, meat patties uh, in the form of veggies. Precisely. Thanks all then. And now we're heading over to the Q&A um, session for those of you who would like to continue discussing. I think we have a link in the chat uh, and see you there. Bye for now. <laughs>